Two days afterward these same magistrates appeared before the cardinal and their spokesman addressed Mazarin with so much fearlessness and determination that the minister was astounded and sent the deputation away with the same answer as it had received from the Duke of Orleans that he would see what could be done and in accordance with that intention a council of state was assembled and this this man named emery was the object of popular detestation in the first place because he was superintendent of finance and every superintendent of finance deserved to be hated in the second place because he rather deserved the odium which he had incurred he was the son of a banker at lyons named particelli who after becoming a bankrupt, chose to change his name to Emery, and Cardinal Richelieu, having discovered in him great financial aptitude, had introduced him with a strong recommendation to Louis XIII, under his assumed name, in order that he might be appointed to the post he subsequently held. You surprise me, exclaimed the monarch. I am rejoiced to hear you speak of Monsieur Dimery as calculated for a post which requires a man of probity, I was really afraid that you were going to force that villain Particelli upon me. Sire, replied Richelieu, rest assured that Particelli, the man to whom your majesty refers, has been hanged. Ah, so much the better, exclaimed the king. It is not for nothing that I am styled Louis the Just. And he signed Emery's appointment. This was the same Emery who became eventually superintendent of finance. He was sent for by the ministers, and he came before them pale and trembling, declaring that his son had very nearly been assassinated the day before, near the palace. The mob had insulted him on account of the ostentatious luxury of his wife, whose house was hung with red velvet edged with gold fringe. This lady was the daughter of Nicholas de Camus, who arrived in Paris with twenty francs in his pocket, became secretary of state, and accumulated wealth enough to divide nine millions of francs among his children and to keep an income of forty thousand for himself. The fact was that Emery's son had run a great chance of being suffocated, one of the rioters having proposed to squeeze him until he gave up all the gold he had swallowed. Nothing, therefore, was settled that day, as Emery's head was not steady enough for business after such an occurrence. On the next day Matthew Mole, the chief president, whose courage at this crisis, says the Cardinal de Retz, was equal to that of the Duc de Beaufort and the Prince de Conde in other words, of the two men who were considered the bravest in France had been attacked in his turn. The people threatened to hold him responsible for the evils that hung over them. But the chief president had replied with his habitual coolness, without betraying either disturbance or surprise, that should the agitators refuse obedience to the king's wishes, he would have gallows erected in the public squares and proceeds at once to hang the most active among them, to which the others had responded that they would be glad to see the gallows erected, they would serve for the hanging of those detestable judges who purchased favor at court at the price of the people's misery. Nor was this all. On the eleventh the queen, in going to mass at Notre Dame, as she always did on Saturdays, was followed by more than two hundred women demanding justice. These poor creatures had no bad intentions. They wished only to be allowed to fall on their knees before their sovereign, and that they might move her to compassion, but they were prevented by the royal guard, and the queen proceeded on her way, haughtily disdainful of their entreaties. At length Parliament was convoked, the authority of the king was to be maintained. One day it was the morning of the day my story begins the king, Louis XIV, then ten years of age, went in state, under pretext of returning thanks for his recovery from the smallpox, to Notre Dame. He took the opportunity of calling out his guard, the Swiss troops and the musketeers, and he had planted them round the Palais Royal, on the quays, and on the Pont Neuf. After mass the young monarch drove to the Parliament House, where, upon the throne, he hastily confirmed not only such edicts as he had already passed, but issued new ones, each one, according to Cardinal de Retz, more ruinous 
than the others a proceeding which drew forth a strong remonstrance from the chief president. Mole whilst President Blank Mesnel and Councillor Browsell raised their voices in indignation against fresh taxes. The king returned amidst the silence of a vast multitude to the Palais Royal. All minds were uneasy. Most were foreboding. Many of the people used threatening language. At first, indeed, they were doubtful whether the king's visit to the Parliament had been in order to lighten or increase their burdens, but scarcely was it known that the taxes were to be still further increased. When cries of down with Mazarin, long live Brousel, long live blank Mesnel, resounded through the city, for the people had learned that Brousel and blank Mesnel had made speeches in their behalf, and, although the eloquence of these deputies had been without avail, it had none the less won for them the people's good will. All attempts to disperse the groups collected in the streets, or silence their exclamations, were in vain. Orders had just been given to the royal guards and the Swiss guards, not only to stand firm, but to send out patrols to the streets of St. Denis and St. Martin, where the people thronged and where they were the most vociferous. When the mayor of Paris was announced at the Palais Royal, he was shown indirectly. He came to say that if these offensive precautions were not discontinued, in two hours Paris would be under arms. Deliberations were being held when a lieutenant in the guards, named Comminges, made his appearance, with his clothes all torn, his face streaming with blood. The queen on seeing him uttered a cry of surprise and asked him what was going on. As the mayor had foreseen, the sight of the guards had exasperated the mob. The tocsin was sounded. Comminges had arrested one of the ringleaders and had ordered him to be hanged near the cross of Dutraher. But in attempting to execute this command, the soldiery were attacked in the marketplace with stones and halberds. The delinquent had escaped to the Rue de Lombards and rushed into a house. They broke open the doors and searched the dwelling, but in vain. Comminges, wounded by a stone which had struck him on the forehead, had left a picket in the street and returned to the Palais Royal, followed by a menacing crowd, to tell his story.